we would like to welcome you again to the join IFAC IEEE CSS webinar series on nonlinear control systems. This is uh, the fifth of the fifth lecture of the series, and it is my pleasure to uh, introduce our guest or our distinguished lecture of the, today. Uh, I think everyone knows uh, Frank Algower from many of his contributions in the field. He is currently affiliated with the Institute for Systems and Theory and Automatic Control at the University of Stuttgart. And today he is going to present his latest work with his team on the data-driven MPC from linear to nonlinear systems with guarantees. Maybe before we start with his talk, I would like to give a bit on his background, although everyone knows the contributions of uh, Frank in the field. I would like to still uh, mention a number of the contributions that uh, Frank has done. Um, he's a director currently of the Institute for Systems Theory and Automatic Control and professor in mechanical engineering at the University of Stuttgart in Germany. He has received many recognitions, including the IFAC Outstanding Service Award, the IEEE CSS Distinguished Member Award, the State Teaching Award of the German State of Baden-Württemberg, and the Leibniz Prize of the Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft. Frank has, has been also the president of IFAC from 2017 until 2020, where we have also seen him in the uh, IFAC World Congress in Berlin. He was the editor for the journal Automatica from 2001 until 2015, and is editor for Springer Lecture Notes in Control and Information Science book series. And he has published tons of uh, articles, over 900. From 2012 until 2020, Frank has served as the vice president of Germany, most important research funding agency, which is the German Research Foundations or DFG. Uh, before we move on to uh, Frank's talk, I would like to announce as well the next speaker that we will uh, have within this series, and that will be Professor Toshiyuki Otsuka from Department of Science, System Science at Kyoto University. He is going to talk about real-time optimization algorithms for nonlinear model predictive control of non-smooth dynamical systems. So please reserve your agenda for 22nd November 2022, which is also a nice number. Now, without any further ado, I would like to give the floor to Frank to, uh, to tell us more about the data-driven MPC. Frank, please yeah. know. Thanks very much, Bayou, for the uh, very kind introduction. Let me share. Can you see my slides? Yeah, clear. OK, perfect. Thanks very much. So um, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thanks very much, Bayou, for the invitation. Uh, to speak here. This uh, nonlinear TCs are really ver very much close to my heart. Uh, maybe I should have mentioned that in, the, in, in my little CV that I provided. I was also the chairman of the IFAC TC on nonlinear systems a uh, little more than 20 years back in time. But today I'm actually giving a talk that is a slightly unusual for, uh, for nonlinear TCs. It's two CCs. Right, because most of the time I will be talking about linear systems, and only in the end show you how that can be extended to nonlinear systems. And I will, will talk about model predictive control, which is also typically not so much in the focus of the nonlinear control community. Even so, with uh, the next talk in the series also being on model predictive control, I think it actually fits. Um, it actually fits quite well. So what I'm going to do, I, as I said, I will talk about mostly linear systems. And in the end, I will give you a nonlinear um, extension of everything. And the nonlinear extension is actually quite good. So what you can look forward to is that we will have a control method in the very end that addresses a fairly general class of nonlinear systems for which we are able to give a, a controller that addresses performance, that will, for which we will have a guarantee of stability, where we will be able to talk about uh, measurement noise. And we will all do that in an input output sense, in the sense that we only have an output measurement available. Plus, we do not even need to know a nonlinear system uh, to achieve all that. So it's uh, quite a mouthful. And so I hope you are patient. What I will do is really slowly build everything up and we'll talk about everything 
in a in a in, in a more conceptual way, not so much going into the details, but I'm happy to answer all the questions for details should you have them. Um, maybe for the start, I should mention that uh, almost everything I'm talking today uh, about is uh, the uh, is a result in the PhD thesis of my student Julian Berberich, or actually my former PhD student Julian Berberich, who is now uh, in academia himself since a couple of months and now uh, on, on, on the track to becoming a professor himself. So because MPC is a little unusual to that community, let me start out with a quick um, a recollection of what MPC is all about. So in MPC, we talk about actually solving an optimal control problem. Our interest is actually an optimal control problem over an infinite horizon. So that is the goal. So we have a cost functional um, that is over the infinite horizon. We have a system description here, just the state uh, nonlinear description can be almost everything. And we want to find a stabilizing control strategy such that this objective function is minimized. And now the interesting thing about MPC is that we can consider constraints, constraints on the inputs, uh, on the states, on outputs, everything. So that's a very general problem that we are solving. And as I, I was teasing already in the end, I will promise you that we will go in that direction and actually really incorporate all these ingredients in the solution in the very end. Now, in MPC, we are not solving the opt open loop, opt not solving the optimal control problem over the infinite horizon, but we are solving it in a way that is tractable, namely by repeatedly solving an open loop optimal control problem. So we are just trying to find an input trajectory, so not a U of X, but a U of time that minimizes our objective functional over the future, starting from the current time. And then we are not applying the whole trajectory that we pre-calculated, pre but we are only applying the very first piece of that trajectory. Now, of course, we cannot compute an open loop trajectory, optimal trajectory over the infinite horizon, but we can only do that over a finite horizon. And that's the reason why in MPC, we are talking about a finite horizon optimal control problem. But we are interested in the infinite horizon problem in a solution to the infinite horizon problem. So, and at the next time step, we are repeating that uh, procedure again. So let me show this with the car cartoon. So we have the current time T here. This is the past and this is the future. So that has already happened. These are predictions in the future. And we are now trying to find an input sequence over a horizon length that we call capital N here, such that our open loop optimization problem is solved and the predicted states and the inputs are such that we are minimizing our objective functional and that we are satisfying the constraints. And then, in the, uh, and then what we are doing, we are not implementing the whole trajectory that we computed, but only the very first piece. And then we are moving one step further, and then we are, we are uh, solving our problem again, now over a shifted horizon. So if we have the optimal solution, we apply this op optimal input for one step, and then we solve it again over a horizon that stays the same. It's a receding horizon method. And this way we are approximately solving the infinite horizon optimal control problem. And one of the big problems in MPC is making a relation between the solution of the open loop optimal control problems over a finite horizon and the closed loop optimal solution over an infinite horizon that we are after. So the approach is really like in chess or go, whatever you want to play. You are at each time step, you are looking a couple of steps into the future. You are only playing your very first step that you thought about and keep everything else for yourself. Then your opponent makes a move. Let's say that's a disturbance. And then you are either continuing along the, the path that you have chosen, or you are re-evaluating and recomputing. Now again, thinking five steps, 10 steps, whatever into the future. So the optimal control problem that we are solving at each time is based on our system description. So that's uh, the, the, the dynamical system that we are having, taking the current measurement into account and taking the constraints into account and minimizing an objective functional. So that is the core of MPC. And then typically we are adding terms, namely a terminal penalty term and a terminal constraint 
And these two terms have nothing to do with our control objective that we try to achieve, but these are our control variables. So this is how we compute the controller beforehand such that we have proper, uh, proper uh, um, systems theoretic properties of our system. So those blue terms are not chosen in order to satisfy certain performance guarantees, but they are chosen in order to have a stabilizing closed loop, for example. And that will be exactly the same also for the database case. Now, the interesting question is really, if you apply an MPC controller like that, will it be stabilizing your system? And the answer is no, it's not stabilizing your system. You have to do something. You have to add those blue terms. If you don't have those, then you will not have a, a stable close to. Now, the biggest difficulty that we are having in MPC is at no point in time, we are having a control law in our hands. So we are only computing trajectories, optimal open loop trajectories in the future, but we never have a U of X at our hands. So we can never plug that in and uh, try to find a Lyapunov function or linearize and look at poles. So we cannot really analyze the closed loop properties of our system in a traditional way. Also, the trajectories we are computing are also not good for analyzing the system because those trajectories they will not, the computed open loop trajectories will not co co uh, coincide with the closed loop trajectories, even if we have uh, no constraints, uh, if, even if we have no measurement error, even if we have a perfect computation of our solution. So closed loop and predicted open loop trajectories are different. And so we cannot base our analysis on that. That makes it very difficult to analyze uh, the stability of the closed loop. So you, what you people usually do in MPC, they are setting up the problem such that we get a stabilizing closed loop. And these are those blue terms that I showed you before, and they are well known for nonlinear systems, for linear systems since about 20 years, I would say 25 years that we know how to compute those terms in order to get good properties of our closed loop. So MPC is a repeated solve a solution of an optimal uh, open loop optimal control problem online that, that you have to solve online. And the key feature is that we need to have a model. That's why it's called model predictive control. So model is the main feature here. And I will be talking about database MPC. So not having a model to at our hands. And interestingly enough, that is possible. So this uh, MPC is a method that is really widely and very successfully applied, not only in academia, but especially in industry. And that can be seen, for example, by the results from the, by the feedback uh, from IFAX Industry Committee. Indust IFAX Industry Committee, a couple of years back, asked people in companies, what are the control methods, the systems theoretic methods that you are currently using that have an impact on your work. And they were also asking, what are the methods that are of importance for you? Or what do you think will be of importance for you in the five years time? And already at that time, model predictive control was number four on that list. So all the other things that we are having, like nonlinear control in general, they are far down the list. So practitioners think model predictive control is important. And looking into the future, model predictive control is seen as the most important uh, theoretical uh, topic for practical applications in industry. So why is that the case? Why do people do that? Not because of the performance objective functional. It's the constraints. People want to be able to satisfy constraints, hard constraints, soft constraints, whatever. Uh, that is really the key feature. And in MPC, a lot of people are saying that if you want to achieve something, don't put it in your objective functional, put it, in, put it in as a constraint, and then you can be sure that you are achieving that. And that's a nice feature that we, that we can have. Plus, we can do the computations in the meantime. It's not possible. And what I will be showing you later is just solving a QP, so a simple quadratic program uh, that you have to solve online. Plus, we will have systems theoretic guarantees that everything really work. And that is not only for the, for the model-based case, but also for the database case. 
But so far, I was always assuming that we have a model. Now, modeling is a time consuming and difficult task. So normally, most of the effort in order to come up with a controller in practical applications is that an engineer is using all her knowledge in order to come up with a model on which then the controller design is based. Now in a data-based world, as we are seeing, we would like to replace that with data. So having a data and then go to models. So system identification is the classical way that we can be chosen. You have data, you identify a model from the data, and then you apply model-based control to your system. But this is not what I'm talking about today. Today, I want to talk about a directly data-driven control design where we never make the detour about a, a model, but we go directly from data to the controller. And we want to do that, especially in such a way that we can still have theoretical guarantees and that we do not have to rely on, uh, on uh, some heuristics or some uh, arguments that uh, you are not able to, to uh, make sure that it really holds. So I don't want to talk here about learning MPC, which is a very popular subject, right? Reinforcement learning and so on, neural networks. So you can learn everything. You can learn your optimal input. You can learn your model. You can learn your cost. You can learn the constraints. There are really hundreds of articles. This is a very popular thing to, uh, to do. And they are, of course, all a data-based method. This is not what I'm going to talk about. So no learning in that talk. And the main reason is that if you include this learning uh, feature into your MPC, then you may get to a good solution, but giving system theoretic guarantees is a very hard thing. And that will take uh, a number of years uh, more in order to be able to give really guarantees, theorem proof type guarantees that you have a stable closed loop, that you are converging and so on. So now let me walk you through what I want to do now in the next uh, half hour plus 45 minutes. So I will talk about Willem's fundamental lemma. This is the basis on which we are building all our results um, in the context of, uh, of data-based MPC. And then I will talk about two things for MPC for linear systems. First, I want to talk about the real simple case when we have no noise. So we have data that are perfectly representing our system, and I will show you the principle. But this is, of course, completely unrealistic. Then I will talk about noisy data and also about robustness. And then we will extend those two results going to the nonlinear case, and I will show you how um, the ideas can be extended to solve really a nonlinear uh, non MPC problem. As I said before, I will do that from a rather high perspective and show you concepts and not so much go into any details, but that should allow you uh, to follow the, the conclusions, to follow the, the theme here in a fairly easy way. So let me first talk about Willem's fundamental lemma. I realize that many of you know that very well. So in Willem's fundamental lemma, we are talking about linear systems. So we have a linear system that we do not know. It's an unknown linear system, but we know there is a linear system behind, and we have this linear system represented by an input-output description, and we have an input trajectory going to an output trajectory of our system. And now we have just one input trajectory and one output trajectory, and what we would like to know is, can we use this one input-output trajectory pair in order to describe our total system in place of a model, or if in, in some other words, if you want, have a directly model-based representation of that, uh, of that linear behavior. Now, the idea, I don't think it goes back to Willems, but that's what usually, uh, what usually is quoted. This paper, a note on persistency of excitation by their authors, you can read here from 2005. And that is a paper that really deals with the question, what are good trajectories in order to represent the system? And clearly, we know that if you give on a linear system a zero input, you get a zero output. That is not a good trajectory. And any other constant input that you are giving to your system is also not a good in, uh, input output representation 
of, uh, of, of your system. So you have to do something else. And that question was answered in that paper. Namely, what the, the authors have been doing is they have been using this trajectory, and I show you it only for the input, uh, because that's the relevant question for the, for the persistency of excitation question, but you can do the same with the output. And they say we have a persistently exciting input of order L. This L is, I don't want to talk too much about it, but that's related to the dimension, uh, the state dimension of our system that we are assuming. Um, that is of, of order L. If we take our data from U0, then U at time point one, U at time point two, and, and so on, up to UL minus one, then we shift by one step, U1, U2, up to UL, U2, U3, and so on, until we are getting to the very end of the, our data. So we have a matrix, which is a Henkel matrix, as the Henkel matrix property. So all the data on the I'm not sure what that is called in English, cross diagonal here, uh, are the same. So U1, U2, 2, U, U3, 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 and so on. Now, if that Henkel matrix has full row rank, so if uh, all the rows of this matrix are linearly independent, then we say this input is persistently exciting of order L. This little m here, think about it, this is the number of inputs. Um, just think about it of being as being as one. So a simple way how to characterize whether an input trajectory is exciting our system enough uh, in order to really give us all the uh, all the dynamics of our system. Not at all surprising, right? We need an input that really excites all the uh, all the the modes of our system, and this is how this is done. Now comes the interesting thing. This result can not only be used in order to uh, classify whether an input is persistently exciting, but we can represent our system G by that result. Namely, if we form Henkel matrices of this one input trajectory, and we do the same for our output trajectory YD. So this is one, just one trajectory UD, YD that we are having. We are putting both in this Henkel form into a big matrix. Then the following theorem can be proven, namely any trajectory of our system, any UY of our system is a trajectory if there exists such an alpha that this equation is satisfied. On the other hand, if you plug in any alpha here, you get a trajectory of our system. So it's an if and only characterization of the dynamics of our linear system. And uh, that is, of course, it's a model if you want so, but a very simple model because you do not have to identify anything. You just take your data on this one trajectory that you are having, putting the data together into a matrix. It's just a matrix. And then the span of that matrix gives you exactly um, your input output pairs. So it's a purely data driven system uh, description. And this paper here that I mentioned before has not been very much cited in the past. So it was published in 2005. If you look at the citations here until 2018, there were not really many, but now it's really taking off. So the 2022 was uh, looked at in, I believe in May or June, I looked since then there are 60 more. So this is growing now exponentially. And the reason is not because you can look at the persistency of excitation problem, but because this is a representation, a data-based representation of the dynamics of your linear system. And of course, you can use that representation in lieu of a, of a model that you are having. You can produce any input-output pair by just plugging in the alphas. So the alpha gives you the, the freedom to have everything known about that system. Of course, that can be ex exploited in um, many different ways. One thing is that you do a data-driven system analysis. You can verify whether the system is stable, dissipative, whether it satisfies uh, IQCs and so on. Lots of things can be done. And here is a limited number of, uh, uh, of papers uh, doing data-based analysis. This is all papers from the last uh, two, three years. So this is something that has not really found more, more interest or, or recognition before then. But you can, of course, also do a data-driven data controller design on that basis. And again, a couple of papers, mostly uh, my own papers, but also some from, from other groups. And you can do lots of different uh, controller designs 
for, uh, for system space of that representation. So if you are interested, if you have not never heard about that, which I assume is not the case, then there is a very nice overview article by Ivan Markovsky and Florian Dorfler that appeared in the uh, annual reviews of control two years, I believe, ago. Uh, that gives a nice introduction to this whole field. What I want to do now today is apply that idea to MPC. So we want to use that model representation in the concept text of model predictive control, replacing our classical model that we are having. And now let me talk first about the noise-free case. So this is again the problem that we are solving at each point in time. We try to find a input trajectory into the future over a finite horizon. Now it's called L, but this is equivalent to the capital N that I uh, mentioned before. And uh, this um, objective function we want to minimize such that we find the input trajectory that it gives us the smallest, uh, the smallest value for that, satisfying constraints on our inputs and our outputs in the future. Now, the difference is only to the, what, what I showed you before, is that our model representation here is now not the classical state space model that we are normally using, x dot equals a of x plus b of u, but our Henkel matrix system representation that we are having that is based only on one measured input output data for which we have to assume or which we have to require that it satisfies the persistency of excitation uh, condition. So we, if we have a trajectory that we measure or are given a trajectory, we can check whether it's a suitable trajectory, persistency of excitation, and then we know this model here is good enough to do our, our uh, simulation. Now, we have to have a couple of small other changes. Normally what is, is done in MPC is we measure the state where we are. Now we have an input output representation, no state in that representation. So we cannot take the state measurement, but what we are doing is we have to assume an initial trajectory that looks into the past. And that trajectory has to be at least as long as the dimension of our system. Of course, we do not want to make any assumption on our uh, uh, on the uh, state dimension of our system. We say we have an unknown system, but we take an N here that is a clear upper bound that we know for sure of our true system behavior. And uh, so we have to take a, a number of, uh, of measurements from the past as initial condition. So this is the only difference. And now you are solving that problem. Um, the, you are looking into the future with U bar, Y bar, our future trajectories over that horizon. And the only additional, uh, the only additional variable that we are having is this alpha here that allows us to specify any, uh, any trajectory. So we have a QP that we are solving now. And the way it is done is exactly in the same way as it is done in classical MPC. So you are just solving uh, that problem at any point in time. Um, then you apply the first input step that you are computing, and then you're shifting everything by one. And then you have a trajectory that an, an input, an initial trajectory that differs by one data point, namely the newest data point that you are adding, and then you are repeating and so on. So the idea actually um, was already uh, formulated in 2015 by Xiao Yuang Li and a co-author here from uh, Shanghai Shaotong University. And they have exactly formulated uh, uh, that description, but it only got popularity three, four years later when a group at ETH and also us were looking into that and we're seeing that there is really a lot of potential in, uh, in that methodology. And since then, lots of development have been taking place, looking at open loop robustness, many practical applications have been done, also extensions for nonlinear systems for moving horizon estimation, encrypted control, distributed MPC, everything has been done. But our contribution was the contribution that we were looking into closed loop properties. As I said before, in MPC, the, the, the going from open loop properties of your open loop trajectories to closed loop trajectories is not trivial. And typically, you're not even having a guarantee. And that is really today's topic. I will show you how that can be done, that we can give guarantees that the closed loop 
uh, really works. Now, will it be maybe automatically stabilizing? No, it will not. I showed you that before. It's the same for a database MPC. And here is uh, um, actually that is even a, an experimental result for a four tank water system, which is a slow and boring system. And it's really hard to make it unstable. And with an MPC controller in which you have a, a horizon length that is smaller than twice the time constant of that, that system, then you will go unstable. So you cannot do anything. It will be unstable. And uh, you have to, in addition, add something to your system. So same for the model base case as it is for the database case. So you have to do something, otherwise you have no guarantee of the functioning of the closed loop. Now, fortunately, the, the thinking from the classical model based uh, MPC case also works for the not for the database case. So in for a model based MPC, we know that if we use so called zero terminal constraints. Namely, that we say at the end of our prediction horizon, we want to be at the point uh, where we where we plan to be, the origin, for example, our steady state pair US YS. Then, if you add that as an additional um, artificial constraint to your system, then one can prove that the closed loop is stable. The proof goes uh, that you take the value function of your uh, of your um, uh, of your MPC problem as a Lyapunov function candidate, and then you can show um, that you are uh, that you are indeed stable. So now the only difference here that we are having is the same as for the initial measurement. So not the x at the time t is our measurement, but past trajectories, and we have to do the same for uh, for the for the US YS pair. We have to demand that at least for n time steps. We are staying there in order to be sure that we are getting there. So it's a terminal equality constraint that you are adding, and you can prove the result. Actually, the proof is conceptually identical to the model based case. You have a couple of challenges because it's in not a state representation, but an input output representation. So one of the, the, the technicalities is that your cost is not a positive definite function at all. But this is a very restrictive uh, method. If you apply that, you can relax that easily, same as in the model based case, because you do not have to necessarily do uh, that with a with the equilibrium you want to go to. But it works also if you use some equilibrium at the very end and you can prove that you are stabilizing or what is very often called quasi infinite horizon MPC in the nonlinear MPC literature is that you add terminal um, set constraints and a terminal penalty term, as I've shown you before, these blue curves. And you can do exactly the same. You can compute those terms offline beforehand in a suitable way, such that you, we can prove uh, the stability of the closed loop. And these computations can be done in a completely data-based way. So you do not need a model in order to come up with this P and with this uh, terminal region here, um, but you can really do that on a, in a completely data-based way. So also exactly the same can be done here. This For those people who are in MPC, um, they know that we also have something like, uh, called unconstrained MPC. Unconstrained MPC is not referring to the fact that there are no constraints in our system, but there can be constraints, but that you do not want to have these stabilizing constraints, these blue terms that I showed you before. And that can also be done in a database uh, case exactly the same way or very similar to the same way we do in a model-based case. We can compute a lower bound on our L such that if we have a horizon longer than uh, that, that we get to a, a stable closed loop with the same advantages as we have in the model based case and the same drawbacks, namely that that is very conservative result and the horizon is much too long for most applications. So everything carries over from the nonlinear from the model based case to the database case and works out very nicely. So that is a very nice thing and we can have the same guarantees for the closed loop. But so far I was cheating a little bit because I was assuming that this 
this representation that we are having, this Willem's fundamental lemma, Henkel norm, Hen 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 not Henkel norm, Henkel matrix representation, that this is an exact representation. But in reality, of course, we have measurement errors. We have errors on the measurement of this one trajectory that we are using in order to form our Henkel matrices. So we have a, an, an error term on that. And we have also, of course, um, measurement noise on our data that we are measuring online. And here for simplicity, we are assuming a very simple um, measurement uh, noise for which we have an upper bound. And for simplicity, we just choose the same, uh, the same bound epsilon bar for the initial data as well as for the online data. Now, that is a much more realistic thing. But now, of course, our Henkel matrix representation does, is not correct anymore. If we have noise here, then, of course, this uh, equation would not be satisfied by an equilibrium. And that is uh, captured by introducing a slack variable, as we always do a slack variable, such that the equations are, again, satisfied. But we do not want to have an arbitrarily large slack variable, because then we do not really satisfy our our, uh, our dynamics, but we want to have a small slack variable satisfying that. That's why we are adding a term, uh, a penalty term to our cost function, penalizing uh, the use of this theta. And we are also using, um, for numerical reasons, a regularization on this alpha parameter that we are having, having here. It's the same reasoning that is uh, also done in linear regression. So if you add those two terms, to our optimization problem. So this is the classical optimization problem. Now we are adding those two terms and we have the sigma here, the slack variable, that is a free variable. Now the slack variable appears here again and we have a noisy measurement in our description here. Then we can again have an MPC formulation that now takes the noise into account. And using that and a few assumptions, we can still prove that we have to satisfy, that we have to get the, the theoretical guarantees for our closed loop. So we need to assume, of course, again, that our UD is persistently exciting. The lambda terms have to be chosen suitably, not too small, not too large. This is actually, uh, from a computational point of view, choosing those is really a little bit a game, so you cannot really compute, at least we do not know how to compute the best terms here, but it's uh, normally in practical applications, no, no difficulty to choose those. And then we have to know the noise bound of our system. At least we have to know that the noise is not too large. And for the time being, we have no output constraints. Then we can really prove rigorously that our set point is now practically exponentially stable if those conditions are satisfied. And if we, we use one of the remedies that I showed you before. Now it's only, of course, practically exponentially stable. We have a noise term uh, shaking our system, and uh, we will not be able to converge really to our uh, to our uh, steady state. That is not possible, so we will stay in the neighborhood of our system. There are a couple of more uh, properties that we can prove, or we do prove, and uh, but I will not go into any detail here. But now think about it: what we have still linear systems, but we have we have a linear unknown system. We have an output feedback MPC formulation. So no measurement of, of the state, no need to estimate any state. We have constraints that we have to satisfy, but we are still able to guarantee that we have a practical exponentially stable closed loop. So that's very nice. You can also include, and I'm looking a little bit at the, at the watch because I want to talk about uh, nonlinear systems, of course. Um, we can also include output constraints so that we really demand for our unknown system for which we only have one trajectory uh, given as a basis in a measurement uh, noise environment that we really satisfy hard constraints in our outputs. Now, how is that done? Of course, what we have to do is we have to use our model description in order to find the bound on the difference of what our our behavior of the true system can do as opposed to the behavior of our model of our system. And there, this you can derive. So this is actually not very difficult, but very tedious. You can drive a bound on the pre prediction error that is caused uh, by, by the noise that you are having. And of course, that bound depends on the 
um, on the noise level that we are having, but also on the value of the sigma and the alpha that we are having. So um, we can really compute that. And then in MPC, what we typically do is we do a, a constraint tightening. So we are saying, okay, in order to achieve that, and we have an error of that kind, let's stay away from that bound as much as our maximum error can be. So we stay, we have as a bound, not the y max, but we make that tighter. That's called constraint tightening by the error that we are, that we can have. Now that sounds really great, but it has an, a drawback. Namely, if you do that, it's not recursively feasible. Recursive feasibility means that once you are feasible one time, then you wanna be sure for any future iteration of your optimization problem, you stay feasible. And that is not the case here. And therefore this is not a solution that is acceptable. So that is not a good bound, but you can come up with a, a, a tighter constraint that we have with a different constraint tightening. Now also taking the U into account. And uh, I, again, I don't wanna talk about how that can be done, but those terms A, K here, they can be computed, AK1, AK2, AK3, AK4, they can be computed for our system completely based on data. And this, if this is done in an appropriate way, then we can really prove that we also have a strict um, constraint satisfaction and we keep recursively, recursive feasibility. So having no model of our system, I'm sorry, having no model, having noise, we can still guarantee that we are satisfying hard constraints in our output for our system and we get practical exponential stability. That's pretty nice. Now you're saying, okay, the world is of course nonlinear, what can be done there? And I wanna give you a glimpse into that. And in the end, if there is a little time left, then I also wanna show you a couple of uh, applications or examples uh, that demonstrate that. Now we can go to nonlinear systems the class of nonlinear systems, we restrict to this class here. So we have an input affine description, even with constant terms here, that is not necessary, that is for convenience only, but the input affinity uh, we, really, we really need, also in our, in our proofs, we need the input affinity. And uh, this can, but this can be always achieved, for example, by taking incremental inputs of, uh, of our system instead of the, the real inputs. Now, the goal that we are doing is we wanna stabilize our set points. Maybe now is a good time to say that. I was always talking about stabilization in an input output framework. Of course, we are stabilizing an output that we wanna go to, but if we wanna be a little more precise, of course, this is the state that the, the steady state that we are having in connection with the output that we are having here. So we wanna stabilize a set point. So this set point here, we have an initial measurement here. And now uh, we wanna do that in such a way that we assume that we have a steady state manifold of our system. Steady state manifold is of course uh, the steady state, any, all the steady state solutions of our nonlinear system that, and that are related of course to an output uh, to an, a steady state output manifold that we call the set YS. So that is the basis that we wanna start out with. Now, of course, we have a nonlinear system and now our fundamental lemma, of course, does no longer apply. There are a couple of extensions around and people are doing quite some research in that direction. Also in my group, uh, we are doing research in, the, in that direction to extend the fundamental lemma to classes of nonlinear systems, but you need basis functions, Kopman operator um, and so on. So it's not very nice. Here, I wanna stick to a linear description of the system and show you that nevertheless, we can do something for our nonlinear system and still give guarantees for this nonlinear system. Let me do an intermediate step here just to explain the concept. Let's go now back again to the model-based MPC case. So we are assuming that we know our model for the time being. I wanna just explaining the concept and then we come back again to the database case where we have no model. But for a few slides, let's assume we have our F, um, the F and the H on that uh, slide before. This is known to us, this model. 
Now, what we can do, of course, we can linearize our system at any point. So not only a necessarily a, a, a steady state of our system, we, we linearize at any point. And then what we are getting at that point is an x dot equals ax plus bu plus an error term. And at that point, if we know our model, we can easily compute that error term. And we can, of course, do exactly the same for our h. So this is the basis that we want to do. And now we are formulating our MPC problem. So it's a model-based nonlinear MPC problem such that we want to minimize our cost functional. And now we are minimizing our cost. Yeah, I'm talking about that in a second. Now, based on our linear system description where we have the error term here. And we have all the ingredients that we want normally have. Now we have our initial measurement. So the X of T is the measurement at that time point. This was what we had to extend to a trajectory in the future. We have a terminal equality constraint here. So at the end of our horizon, we assume we are at some steady state and this some steady state we leave open. And I will tell you exactly what we want to do. So we want to go to an YR, right? But at the moment we say XS, US, any one of those will do. And the only requirement is that at this XS is a steady state of our system. So it satisfies uh, this equation. Now, of course, if we control our system to any steady state, that is not a good solution. We want to go to the reference point that we want to go to. And therefore we are adding a term to our equation. So we have a difference between the ys that belongs to the steady state we are leaving to the optimizer to determine. And we are requiring that this ys is not too far away from this r. And this we do by a weight uh, capital S that we are adding here. Now, for that so solution, for that solution, we can do again that same MPC problem. We solve online at any point in time, and we use at that point in time for the current measurement, the description that we have. So the A here is a time varying A that will change from point to point where we are. So does the EXT here. We solve our optimization problem, get an input uh, to our system, and then we apply that input. We come to the next step. We linearize again our system and we solve the problem again. So the idea is essentially shown here. We are starting out with the YR. We want to go to the, uh, the Y0. We want to go to the YR. And that is our steady state output manifold. And what we are doing at each time step, we are not going directly to the YR, but we are going to a point on our equilibrium manifold for which we want to do, we want to have that it's not too far from the YR so that we are sliding along the trajectory coming closer to the YR. And because we are going to the closest point on our equilibrium manifold, we are not making such a big error because we are closer here and we use this linearization, we will have a good representation and that good representation, then we can capture with the robustness of our MPC formulation. So for that, model-based, again, we can give guarantees. If some assumptions hold, and actually don't want to talk too much about those assumptions, they are not very hard. Some of them are rather just technical assumptions. And if we are not too far away from our equilibrium manifold, and if our S is sufficiently small, then our YR can be proven to be exponentially stable. And we have closed loop guarantees for controlling our nonlinear system using a linear MPC. So this is a result in the model-based case. I would say it's another very exciting result, but it, it's needed uh, as an intermediate step for the classical case, because we have much better ways if we have a nonlinear model in order to guarantee stability and come to the closed loop. So now we want to go again to the data-driven case. And the idea is exactly the same. So we are starting here with our Y0. We want to go to the YR. And now our system will um, approach the YR on some trajectory. And what we are using is in order to form our Henkel matrix, always the last capital N measurements that we came by. So we using the trajectory along which we progress to the YR in order 
to form our Henkel matrix that we are having. So if this data would be really a representation of the linearization of our system, then we would be done already with the proof. But of course it is not. So this is the data of the nonlinear system. And we cannot do the same as in the model based case because we don't have the linearization of our uh, nonlinear system. But the difference between the linearization and the, the true nonlinear and the nonlinear behavior, this can be bounded. And this bound, again, we can use in order uh, in our proof and can show that if S is small enough, then we can that we are this linearization is an approximation of our true nonlinear behavior and everything works very nicely. So we can put all this together. So what we are doing is we are using wide UDs and YDs now changing time variably along the trajectory that we are going. So we have at each time step a new description, which is a wrong description and also not the linearization of our system. But we know an error bound, or actually we don't have to know the error bound. So we only know that the error bound exists. And now we are adding all the terms that we had before. So that our steady state point to which we want to go now, again, fully formulated in the YS framework is not too far away from the YR. We are adding those two robustness terms in the very end to make really sure that everything works despite the fact that our system description is not the correct one. So this matrix here will change all the time. We use the, uh, the, the, the measurement of the past data as our initial condition. We have uh, the, the terminal condition of our system does not need to be this formulation with the equality term. You can use any other one. We can have our constraints of the system and formulate that as our new optimization problem. So for our nonlinear system, we have a formulation that again gives us a convex QP formulation that we can solve in a fairly easy way. And now comes the interesting thing. If you satisfy a number of assumptions, and these assumptions are mostly that we, of course, have to ensure that we are persistently exciting along the trajectory that we are following, which is a non-trivial thing to do. Because, for example, once you arrive at your steady state, then you are not exciting anymore. And then this breaks down. So you have to do something. But there is lots of empirical things that you can do in order to ensure that. If you have a couple of other assumptions on your nonlinear system, but nothing too severe, and you have need another condition, namely that your initial data through which you start out at the very beginning is not too dynamic. That's essentially what this is saying so that you are close to a, a, um, a linear behavior for the very first uh, end data points that you are having, then you can really prove in a rigorous way. This is a, an IEEE transactions article that only appeared, I think, a month or two ago in the transactions. And then we can prove again that for our nonlinear system, our set point is practically exponentially stable, and we can give a lot of other uh, conditions that are very similar to the conditions that we have for the, for the model-based case. So think about it, what we are having here. So we have a nonlinear system. We have no state. We have no model. We have measurement noise. We have, um, we have constraints on our system. And now we still can come up with a stabilizing control formulation that gives us practical exponential stability in a rigorous way and satisfies our constraint. So I would say um, without taking my mouth too full, it's very difficult to achieve something like that in a different way. Of course, you pay a price. The price is we look at linearization. So performance is not optimal. So you would really expect that you get a performance that is suboptimal when you compare it to the optimal nonlinear behavior. But at least you have the guarantee that your constraints are satisfied, that you have stability in the closed loop, and you have a very simple representation, hard, hardly to do any computation, and no need to do a modeling of your system. You just need to, to let the system go um, in order to have uh, these guarantees satisfied. Let me at the very end, few, few, uh, very few minutes, I will talk about um, some applications 
Uh, one is a simple continuous steel tank reactor, so a nonlinear system that we are having here. And for that nonlinear system for which we assume that we do not know it, we just apply MPC. So we do a model-based MPC, which is the red line. So we want to go from this initial condition to that to that uh, output value here. And as you can see, the model-based MPC is by far the best. And this has to be expected because there you really have a, uh, the model of your system. Now the black and the blue curves are data-based MPCs. So in the black curve, what we are doing is we are taking the last n steps of our, of our measurement where we are, and we identify a model from that, and then we are applying a linear MPC based on that model. But we are doing that repeatedly at each step. We do an identification of the model and do a prediction on that basis. And the blue curve here is our data-based MPC. As you can see, those data base are pretty much pr fairly close together and the performance is very similar. So the only difference is that the blue one is much simpler. We don't have to do any identification. Plus with the identification case, you are not able to give any guarantees. At least I would not be able to, to know how to do, how to give any guarantees. But for our blue curve here, we can give system theoretic guarantees. So here is a practical experimental result for uh, this boring four tank system. And uh, I wanna only show you that uh, because of this initial part here. So just if you start your system, your MPC controller, you don't have any measurements. So at the very beginning, your stack is empty from which you compute the Hankel matrices. So you have to do just something during that time. And that is a time during which you are really lost so you have to, you'd have to take n steps into the future before you can do something. And once you are at your steady state, you are losing again your persistency of excitation. So you have to be also very careful uh, in that case what you are doing. But as I said, there are nice heuristics that you can apply in order to, to work around those two cases. I want to also show you um, a real practical application in that was done in connection with the Institute for System Dynamics in Stuttgart, Oliver Savotny's group. It's a very nice uh, soft robot that they are having, having pneumatics and modeling this soft robot is really a very complicated thing to do. And then coming up with a controller design for that soft robot is really uh, compl complicated. And this can also be handled in our uh, database MPC world not really in the way I showed you. So it's more a data-driven predictive disturbance observer that we are doing. But what I want to show you is nevertheless the, uh, the uh, result over time. So here is a time span when we have this uh, data-based MPC switched on. And before and after, it's not switched on. And as you can see, uh, this, this uh, robot arm follows poorly the desired trajectories before. When we switch on our data MPC, it's very nicely, even if we have a set point change. If we switch it off again, it goes back to a fairly bad behavior. So let me come to the conclusion. MPC with a data-based model and some novel theoretical analysis is able to give us nice closed loop guarantees while a lot of questions are still open. So this is initial research, lots of things, have to be done in the future, but a, a, a very complicated problem can be tackled already with the methods we currently have. So here you see a number of the applications uh, that we have on that subject. Also the, uh, a QR code that, that brings you to our web page where we have those papers uh, for download. And I wanna mention again that this is mostly Julian's um, uh, Julian's dissertation results together with uh, Johannes Köhler, who is also a former PhD student uh, from my group, who is now a postdoc at ETH Zurich, and Matthias Müller, who is a professor at the University of Hanover. But many years back, he was also a PhD student and then postdoc in the group. So thank you very much for your attention. And now maybe I'm cool enough now to look at the questions that are in the chat. Thanks for, uh, for listening to me. Right. Uh, th thank you, uh, Frank, for a very uh, clear and uh, an, uh, excellent uh, talk that you have presented. We do have an, a number of uh, questions uh, on in the chat. Uh, maybe I would 
like to ask uh, Arijit to turn on your microphone if you'd like to ask questions. Yeah. Uh, hi, Frank. Uh, thank you very much for this nice presentation. Um, my question was, so here the constraints you're considering is uh, the input output constraints. But suppose there are some constraints which are about the internal states, which are not really showing up at the outputs. Could you still uh, preserve those constraints? I mean, can, uh, yeah, uh, preserve those constraints uh, through data-driven MPC? No, of course not. The states are not known to us. This is a concept here that we do not have, right? So we do not have any states. And if mm -hmm. you are interested in some states, then you have to place those states as an output in your system. Otherwise, we are not able to really do something about something that you do not know. So it's a purely input-output formulation, which is a huge advantage, right? Because yes. states is a, an indirect concept that we very much like in the nonlinear control world, also in the linear control world. Yeah. But we are interested in the whys. If you have something additional that you're interested in, put it as an output. Okay, and uh, another quick question is that you always have this presumption uh, 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 of. Uh, oh, okay, 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 sure, sure. I would like to, because we, ha we have a limited time, uh, Arita. Okay. I would like no, to uh, move on to uh, Said, if you like to ask questions, Said. Thank you very much, uh, Frank, for a nice presentation. So, my question is uh, like uh, the framework uh, Lars Kroon uh, introduced about dissipativity and MPC for stability guarantee, strict dissipativity and turnpike property. And I think you have some contribution on that as well. So, how about how would you comment? Uh, are some results known for data driven in data driven framework, or how would you comment on that? Yeah, so this is actually something that we are doing at the moment, and, and, and it really also carries over. So that's really one of the nice things, all those ideas, all of the ideas. We didn't find anything yet that we know from the model-based case can be carried over to the database case. And dissipativity is really uh, one of the things that we can carry over very nicely because our starting point five years ago when looking in the database world was really on the dissipativity case. So we wanted to analyze dissipativity and so on. Yes, carries over one-to-one. -one. And please be a little patient. Uh, the paper will be submitted to the World Congress in a few days, <laughs> the AFAC World Congress. And then we put also a paper online uh, on archive that shows those results. Thank you very much. Looking forward to it. Thank you, Fran. And uh, we still have a question from Oluk Benga. If you'd like to turn on your microphone and uh, you can ask questions. Yeah. Thank you so much, Frank, uh, for, a very, uh, for a great talk. Um, so uh, where my question is, uh, uh, so in your talk, uh, we see that uh, the data that is actually used is, is the data that is collected along the trajectory of the system as it operates. But for some industrial application, you have huge amount of data that has been sitting there for a long time. So my question is, there is there a way to incorporate this data into this framework? Um, yeah, well, in the, in the linear case, this would be great, right? The more data yeah. we have, the better we are off. Um, and also I did not talk about that, but the, 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 the uh, singular value of our Henkel matrix gives us a lot of information about how good our data are. So how far yeah. we are away with our smallest singular value from the zero point is another interesting thing. And if you have past data, use the best data that you can get. If and you can also get to big Henkel matrices if you think this is necessary in order to describe uh, the behavior. But for the nonlinear case, it makes no sense, right? Because mm -hmm. we want to capture the dynamics of the system. And we want to only capture the dynamics of the systems in the vicinity of the trajectory where we are currently are. And so mm -hmm. if you would be using wrong data from the past yeah. that is represented for a behave representative for a behavior that is uh, collected at some other point uh, in your let's say state space in quote then this would not be helpful in in fact it would be counterproductive so for yeah. the nonlinear case really this is not helpful but if you assume that you have a linear system which you do not have in chemical uh, industrial applications then it would be very helpful but it's a good question nevertheless yeah thank you Thank you, uh, Frank. Uh, maybe one uh, question from uh, from my side. 
although I do have uh, many questions. So in your uh, applications with a soft robot, uh, you show that you are tracking actually a uh, periodic signal. It's not a, a constant signal. Are you incorporating some sort of a model of your reference signal in your in 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 the way you co compute the MPC? Well, the MPC here is really just it's not really the solving the oh, control problem. So it's really a very indirect. Uh, but I didn't have time to put that no in. Problem. By the way, that is a result that will be presented at CDC in Cancun. So if you guys are interested, so there there you can have a whole whole talk uh, on that subject. Um, so it's very difficult to say. And I do not believe that there is an internal model in that case. Right, I think you know what, uh, I'm, uh, what I'm aiming a at. A tracking yes. problem. And that means also you can change your, your frequency, you can, uh, of, of, the, of the signal and the, still the controller would work. With an internal model principle, you have to know the frequency. Yeah, okay. So uh, thank you again, uh, Frank, for the excellent talk. Uh, and I would like to again announce that there will be, uh, our next talk will be on the 22nd of November by uh, Toshiko Otsuka from uh, Japan. So I would like to wish you all a nice afternoon, morning, evening uh, in uh, for the many different part of the world and see you next time. Thank you. Thanks very much for coming and for listening to me. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.